All right, thank you all for coming. It's quite a popular talk. So we have Oren Shaw, whose um, the talk is called Why Salt? Uh, she came all the way from New Zealand and is the founder of Ayara, a DevOps consultancy. So please welcome her. Hi, everyone. Yes, the mic is on. Um, as mentioned, I am IR, or I'm Oren. I founded IRA DevOps um, because I really enjoy working with infrastructure problems. Um, we spend a lot of time doing Chef and Puppet and Salt. Um, we've just heard from Marcus on why we need configuration management at all, which was a really interesting talk. If he's still in the room, thank you. Um, and continuing from there, I'd like to talk a little bit about why we might want to use SaltStack to like, start meeting some of those needs. Um, but before I can explain why SaltStack and why it is really cool for me, uh, I have to give you a bit of history. Um, so my background is, um, I come from a development background, which is really a, my entire mindset. I love to write code, I love to make things, I love to type, I, have to, I love to have an idea and type it out and then hit a button and then the world physically changes around me. This is a really powerful sense of power and control over the universe that I have. And this is really neat. Um, and I've done it professionally for a while. And in my professional career, um, I wrote a lot of code and not as many documentation pieces as possibly I should have, and maybe once I'd written them, I was possibly even less good at keeping them up to date. You might be familiar with this kind of story. Um, well, from running into people like me who are not very good at it. Um, and so a few years back, I was working on this extremely large um, twisted network service. This is a big project. I was kind of working on it by myself. Um, and I bumped into some problem, and I was trying to like, work with a colleague to get it running, or to get it running with them so that they could help me debug it. And I gave them all of my code and all my docs and everything I was using to get it running, and I said, okay, this is the problem we're going to see when we run the test cases. Please help. And they ran the test cases, and it crashed out far earlier, like something was going very visibly wrong. And we struggled with it, and we struggled with it. We spent a couple of hours digging into the code, like actually really going through the code, trying to find out why exactly it was failing. And Twisted at the time was a bit hard to debug. Um, and eventually I just kind of shrugged and I said, it works for me. And now I wince when I think that I said this. Um, because now with the, the benefit of hindsight, I can see that what I was saying wasn't that it was working for me or for not, for me or not but that it wasn't working at all. And I say this because a few hours later, um, I discovered that the way I was running the program was in Python optimized mode, and they weren't. And if you've never bumped into this flag before, Python optimized mode turns off assertions. That's the only thing it does, it turns off assertions. So they were crashing out with assertion failures, and I wasn't, and we couldn't figure it out. And a couple hours later, I had to go back and say, I'm sorry, this was actually completely my fault. Um, but we fixed that bug and I got their help, and that was great. Later on, we were working with the systems administration people to try to get this like running in production so other people could use it. And this was the very first time I was exposed to Puppet, you know, like configuration management as a whole. And all of a sudden, I had this entire set of tools and methodology by which I could reason about not just my program, not just the thing I had written, but the entire server it lived on and the ecosystem, the network that it was a part of. And I started to realize that software without a computer, without this surrounding, is just a bunch of text. And I can print it out and drop it on the floor. And without the computer, that's all it is. Just words. And until I have made a program that lives, that has that surrounding tissue, it isn't a program that works. And until I've made it in such a way that I can give it to somebody else, I can give it to the systems administration team, or I can work with them. I haven't made a program at all, I've just made a mess. So I bumped into the Puppet, and I, I started learning about this, and I bumped into like, the, these ideas, these core principles about what this was saying to me, how, I sh how this should inform what I'm doing in software development. Things like consistency and repeatability, and Mark has kind of touched on these ideas. Um, principles that if I had had at the time I was writing this and trying to debug this problem, I would never have bumped into it works for me. 
because it would have worked, or it would have not worked for me and my colleague, or it would have worked for me and my colleague. Isolation, so that I can control all of my variables, so I can ensure consistency and repeatability. And that kind of is the core of configuration management. So when I say salt is configuration management, I'm saying salt fulfills these principles for me. Salt gives me these tools to reason about my program and my server and my network all at once. But as a developer, a history of develop, being developer, I can't just take things as they are. I can't just say, okay, this is cool, let's just throw that in production. I have to know how they work. I have to understand the base principles upon which they grow. I had to understand the design goals of SALT. Where was it coming from? Now, who's worked with Puppet? Who's worked with CF Engine? And you can see that Puppet kind of grew out of trying to be a better CF Engine. That's kind of its provenance. I mean, I'm told this is apocryphal. Um, I wasn't there, I was kind of wee. Um, but this is what I'm told. Looking at SALT, that's not its provenance. SALT did not grow out of trying to be a better configuration management system. SALT grew out of, I have this bunch of servers here, and you know, wouldn't it be great if I could just run commands on all of them at once? That'd be lovely, maybe I could do that. That's, what SALT came out, that's where SALT came from. And that's not configuration management at all. That's remote execution, that's remote procedure call. It's complete and total. And from there, if we look at like, some examples of what a SALT command on the command line would be, we're seeing that. We're addressing a server, we're running a command, we're getting a result. We're addressing multiple servers. We're running their commands on each server, we're getting a result from each server at once. One command, many servers. This is the basis of SALT. We can run arbitrary shell code on all of our servers at once. So this is from a very basic, uh, in a VM, running in slash root, apparently that's, I don't know, that's what it is. Um, so I think about this as why this is interesting. What are the implications of this? What does remote execution mean? Well, it tells me that these commands are being run on a server and being pushed out to the client. So clearly I have a client server model with live client daemons running at all time to receive these commands. If I look at test.ping and cmd.run from here, I can see those aren't shell code, but we're passing in shell code. Looking at those, those are a class and a method. We have test, the class, ping, the method. CMD, the class, run, the method, PWD, the arguments. So we're calling Python code across the wire. This also tells us that we have something on the server, a callback, that's being run when we get a result from our client. And this is the basis of configuration management with SALT running Python classes on a client, getting results. And this is an example of what um, a state would look like in SALT. We see the same pattern. We have a class, file, a method, managed, and a list of arguments. And I'm sorry the red is not highly legible. It says, hello, PyCon AU. Um, and at the top, we've given this entire resource a name so that we can refer to it later. Um, I'm not going to be going deeply into how salt programming works and just touching on the core concepts. What else does this tell us? Well, we know we've got a client, we know we have a server, we know there's a server callback that happens, which is telling me that this is asynchronous. It's telling me that there's a two-way communications channel. And if we look underneath, we can see zero MQ sockets held open, the client and server is talking all the time. Because we're dealing with config management, we have to deal with dependency, uh, a list of dependencies as things get installed, such as I have this service, and when its config file changes, I need to know to restart that. This is a standard configuration management pattern. I know that I must have some mechanism internally to describe that. And that, I wouldn't, I would show you code, but. I can know that that's there. So that I know that internally in Python, that's a function call to do that, to set up that dependency, to match that graph. And in SALT, with this strong client server architecture, what if having the entire server complete is a callback itself? I'm gonna tell you a story. 
Um, I used to work at Catalyst IT, which is a web services company out of Auckland, or not Auckland, Wellington, sorry. Um, I don't know why I said Auckland. And while I was working there, we were working on bringing up an OpenStack cloud. Um, and as you know, OpenStack runs across many servers. And we were using Puppet for the, orchestra or for the provisioning of all of these servers. And if you've worked with Puppet, you know that it's great for individual servers. It's really good to say, I need a Neutron. And you provision it and bring it up, and it goes. I need a Nova. You can provision it, bring it up, and it goes. And that's the network management and compute management, respectively. But we were using uh, MariaDB in a multi-master mode. And that was a bit more complicated with Puppet. You set up one, and then the next, and then the next, and then you bring up the primary, and then you get the slaves to connect to it, and hope it all kind of works out. And if it doesn't, you tear it down and try again. And we tried M Collective, we tried Fabric, and neither of these tools really worked out that well. And when I left, we ended up just running Puppet over and over again until it converged properly, and we had a working system, or a system we hoped was working. Salt, instead, lets us describe this in terms of server completion, not just individual resource completion. I don't have to say my database is running. I can say my database cluster is running as a whole. Um, and this is it, like a huge benefit over Puppet. So to give an example of how this would work, I can install my database with the Salt server. And so this is um, showing Salt telling it to do it, getting a reply go off to my first webhead and say, actually, go run the Django migrations, which goes off and tells the database, yep, I'm running that, and comes back. And then Salt finally says, okay, now I can bring up all of my webheads. Because until that point, the database didn't exist. None of them would have come up. It all would have crashed. In Puppet, I would have been running this over and over and over again, trying to get it to come up, or waiting until everything is aligned. In Salt, I can run one command and bring it all up once or have it not fail all once. Um, that gets into Marcus and the uh, reversibility of this, which I'm not going to touch on. So this is really powerful for bringing up and starting new environments. But if we were working with existing environments, like why would we add salt if we're not trying to make new things? Well, if we go back to what we know about the environment, we know we have two-way communication. We know that the server sends data opens a callback, and gets a receipt. I'm sorry? I'll answer that at the end. Um, what if the server didn't have to send something first? In salt, it doesn't have to. We have the reactor. We can send out-of-band signaling. So to go back to our uh, web server example, when their database provisioning is, is finished, we get the normal message coming back saying, hey, I've done this part, you can move on to the next stage of the orchestration. But we can also send an out-of-band message and say, hey, the database is provisioned. And because everyone uses Slack nowadays, Salt can then hand that message off to Slack and say, let everyone know that the database is provisioned and we're moving on. This is out of the box with Salt. It would look like that. It's the same pattern. We have an uh, object, event, a method, send, a list of arguments. But that's not really out of band fully. I mean, we're still in the middle of a main salt run. Stuff is still happening. We can do really out of band events. From the command line, we can call off to the master and say, hey, run this event, which will then go off to, in this case, our, that's not very legible either, I apologize. It will go off to our Slack, our Slack system and say, hey, we're done. And this is a predefined um, message within Slack or within Salt itself. The client is running on its own in this case. It is sending a message completely disconnected from anything else the Salt master is saying or doing. It's just initiating, initiating on its own. But this is shell code, and we're Python does, right? We can do it from Python. Any Python can import the salt library, connect in, and send messages. Which gives us really cool powers like being able to have our CI server tell salt, hey, I've got a new build. And the salt would go, hey, there's a new build. 
I should put that on, on dev and let everyone know that it's running. Because we're using Python, any external source that we can talk to with Python can become an event injector into our salt system. And that's just custom sending. We can also do custom receipt. I would show you a code example, but the snippet is quite a lot longer. Um, but to give you an example of why that would be useful, I'm working with some people who are using RabbitMQ in production. And part of their auto-scaling story is adding new RabbitMQ nodes to their cluster. Um, who's worked with RabbitMQ? A couple of people. And you know that adding nodes to the cluster is a bit tricky, but pulling them out, you need to go through a defined set of steps. You can't just pull the plug on the server. With custom receivers, I could have a piece of software running on the node I want to shut down, and I could have it walk through the orderly shutdown process and then send me an event saying, hey, I'm done with that, outside of a main salt run. This is happening completely on its own without needing to do a full, hey, do everything, provision all of the machines. And then once that's done, I can go off and fully pull the plug on that machine. This is extremely powerful. This is getting into like actively, like really reactive infrastructure where servers are taking an active role in their own maintenance and their own management. They're handling their own failures. And they're not just letting me know that something has failed and caught fire, but they're doing something useful about it. And this is all, everything I've shown you so far, or talked about, is out of the box. None of this requires custom plugins. None of this requires custom, well, this requires some custom code, but no custom plugins or anything that will break as Salt upgrades itself. It works today, it will work tomorrow. And this is giving us power to do like, this sort of reactive infrastructure stuff that we would normally need AWS for. We can do it on AWS and OpenStack at the same time. We can treat an entire set of infrastructure that may span multiple clouds as well as on-premises hardware without needing to tie ourselves to APIs. So while we were at Catalyst, this would have been really great. We would have been able to describe the entire system as a single piece and bring it up as a single piece and tear it down largely as a single piece. But the development environment would have been much easier to work with, much easier to reason with. This is really a lot of why I'm finding Salt extremely, uh, extremely exciting. But I can't just come up in front of you and say, hey, this thing is cool, without telling you, hey, this thing isn't cool in some very specific ways that you need to know about. I think this is, will give you like, the sort of information you need to make good decisions or decide whether or not you need to do, do more research yourself. Things like Salt is new. Puppet and Chef have long established provenance. Ansible is, uh, I believe, newer than Salt, or older than Salt. Um, as a result, there's a lot more bugs. Not a lot of bugs overall, but just more bugs. We haven't had enough eyes looking at it yet. Edge cases get a bit weird. If you're trying to do something that's outside of the salty way, things might act weird. There's not, and as a result of that, there's not gonna be as many blog articles or Stack Overflow posts that cover why you might be having this problem or how you might get out of this problem. Um, and this is changing, like it is getting a lot better. The SALT documentation is great. I definitely recommend looking at it. There's a lack of underlying resource versioning, and before I say what that means, who's worked with Chef? Okay, so in Chef land, I can have a server, or a central server, and two servers that are both described by the same resource thing, right? In Chef, they're called cookbooks. My production system is running version one, and my dev system is running version two. In salt land, if I ran, salt, if I ran the same roll everything out again, my production instance would get clobbered. It would get whatever version two was. In Chef land, I could just keep rolling and rolling versions on the dev machine. And the production one wouldn't change until I asked it to. Salt doesn't have this. Um, and this, I work with Chef on a day-to-day -day basis. This is a powerful feature. It is highly useful and I would like to add this to Salt. If you know Puppet and all of the entertainment of file ordering and how it doesn't order in file order Salt does kind of have the same problem. Um, files are treated as an ordered set as they're loaded, 
So they kind of have order, but things can push them out of order. If you need strong dependency ordering, you have to do it manually. Salt uses YAML files on disk with a Jinja templating language wrapped around it, uh, very similar to Ansible. Unfortunately, it's really hard to get it to dump out what's in the Jinja context object that it gives you. It's really hard to find out what's in there and what you might be looking for. This is a problem I keep having. And it might have gotten better very recently. The event system, as cool as it is, is also hard to debug. But this is not a salt problem. This is a distributed systems or pro hard problem. Um, there's not great tools for it, but there's not great tools in general for this. There was a really good open source web management platform for dealing with salt called Halide, or Halite, rather. It's been deprecated. They're, as far as I know, not working on a new one, and the one you can get is part of the salt managed platform. So you have to give money away. That's not great. Um, but that's really like why I find salt really exciting and why it's got some rough edges. Thank you very much. All right, questions? Thank you. Um, fantastic talk, thank you very much. Um, you. I'll actually reiterate a question that I gave to Tom yesterday uh, during his talk about DevOps related things. Um, one of the issues that I've had getting involved with Salt is just trying to work out how to do stuff the first time, which you've kind of identified some of the documentation is problematic. But the requirements that I actually have in production aren't that unusual, you know, master-slave database, two, two web servers, a worker box, blah, blah, blah. What's the state of like, ready to use recipes, okay, you've got a stack, you want these five things, just take those files, put them there, and run that. Is that even viable as a, take, take all these, put your name here, and it will work? Or is that even, is that a possibility, or? Um, so, what I'm hearing is, is there something like the Chef Supermarket or the Puppet Forge, uh, lib yes. uh, central library? I suppose, yes. Kind of, sort of. Um, there's a Git repo which has all of the salt con contributions in it, and it's really easy to bring that into your system, but it lacks the, the external, this is the central place everything lives, this is how you bring it in. It is quite bespoke in that way. Uh, curated at all, or is it just kind it of It is curated by the salt stack, right, okay. uh, the salt stack foundation, company, the entity of salt stack. Um. I don't know much about salt at all, so uh, uh, this might be uh, just a stupid question, but how does salt handle uh, item potency in, you know, um, versus uh, Ansible's method? Um, I'm gonna need a little more detail. So basically, if, so, if a file has been touched, mm -hmm. it's not gonna touch it again and, and uh, destroy what's already in there. Oh, yes. Um, salt will act very much like um, Puppet or Chef will in that if you've modified a file after salt has run, it will do a, a comparison and rewrite the file if it has changed. So you will lose on disk changes with that. Similar to Puppet, it lets you integrate with, um, I don't know how you say the word, Augeus, which is uh, a tool for modifying files in place. Um, so changing out little snippets of the file, but I've always found Augeus extremely difficult to work with. Um, but otherwise it does the standard check if it's changed, change it back. If nothing, do nothing. Um, <clears throat> so what, what I liked about Salt at first the most was the static configuration. But then we started to run into problems where, say we'll dynamically scale something with the event system mm -hmm. and the config files end up a bit different because of that. And then you might wanna run the static configuration again and things will change. How do you kind of manage that kind of thing? Very carefully. Um, <laughs> Because you're run to more complicatedly answer that, doing the event system and doing the main static runs are very different in salt. Um, they use the same configuration files, the salt states, but how they interact is different and it becomes a very site specific thing, how you can deal with that, how to mitigate weirdness like you're running into. I can't say there's a good general way that I know of. I'm sorry. I'm Canadian, I'll say I'm sorry a lot. 
Any other questions? Um, some of the environments that we oh, manage, um, sometimes it's hard to install an agent on it or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've noticed that Salt seems to have an agentless model as well. Um, question is, have you ever used that? And what is your experience with that? Yes, it does. Yes, I have. And my experience with it has been very positive. Um, it does require a little bit of extra setup in terms of telling Salt how to reach other machines over SSH. But once you've done that, you get most of the benefits of Salt. Um, you get full access to the orchestrator, but you lose access to the event system. That does require something to be there to send events back. But the Salt SSH client, it's in one of those places where resources are a bit lacking. So there are different bugs, but it is overall quite stable and quite useful. Thank you. As well as Salt SSH, I'm aware of Salt proxy technology. Have you used that? Have, can you give some similar comments like you did to the last question? Um, for, sorry, I haven't used Salt proxy. Thanks. It sounded like you'd actually used the reactor system fairly heavily. Uh, how, how far have you used that for making dynamic infrastructure? So someone mentioned sort of scale out earlier, and I, I've seen people talk about using the reactor to sort of initiate things based on system load and, and that kind of dynamic event-based configuration. I haven't used the full power of the autoscaler. Like Salt has uh, integration hooks where it can directly manipulate um, AWS or OpenStack resources, it can build VMs on its own and inject a salt client into them and provision them. Um, what I've done was more the CI sort of stage, using the reactor to capture a CI event, um, trip off a Docker build from there, and when that's finished, um, send events to deploy Docker, as well as update a central repo saying, this version of Docker is in the wild now, or this version of this particular artifact is in the wild now. Um, so I haven't used the, the direct auto-scaling stuff. Any more questions? All right, well, thank you very much, Aaron. Great. Thank you all.